Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us to learn about how to prepare for an underground storage tank investigation. My name is Rachel McMath and I am one of the presenters for today's webinar. Traditionally, we have given this presentation at small workshops across the state, but now that we've gone remote, we are able to reach out to more people. I'm happy to report that we have over 300 people registered across these four webinars. As I said, I am Rachel McMath and I'm a Compliance Assistant Specialist with the Small Business and Local Government Assistance Section, or SBLGA. I'm located in our San Angelo Regional Office. My co-presenter is Becky Costigan, and she is also a Compliance Assistant Specialist with SBLGA and is in our Houston Regional Office. We have Compliance Assistant Specialists in almost every area of the state that can help you with your questions about environmental rules and regulations. If you have any questions during this webinar, please feel free to submit them in the Q&A panel on the right side of the screen. Your questions will be moderated throughout the webinar. For site-specific questions, we encourage you to email us at psthelp at tceq.texas.gov or to call our toll-free hotline number at 800-447-2827. Here's an overview of what we'll discuss today. First, we're going to go over the investigation process and the different checklists that can be used during an investigation. Next, we'll talk about the assistance we provide at SBLGA and direct you to resources that you may find helpful. We will then go over the contents of the UST Compliance Notebook, which has examples of records that are needed to show compliance. After I'm done with my presentation, we will have a brief Q&A session before taking a short break and switching presenters. When we get back from the break, Becky will finish going through the UST Compliance Notebook. She will also talk about how to request records from the TCEQ. When she's done presenting, we will have another Q&A session, so please remember to post your questions in the Q&A panel. Okay. I'm gonna start by giving you a little background information about the Energy Policy Act of 2005. This act requires all states to inspect all underground storage tanks every three years. There are over 21,000 underground storage tank facilities in Texas, which means that TCEQ and its contractors are required to do about 7,000 inspections each year. Often, there are a lot of violations cited as a result of these inspections. In fiscal year 2021, we had over 225 administrative orders filed against PST facilities with an average penalty of about $6,520. Our hope is by doing these webinars, we reduce these numbers by giving PST facilities the tools they need to be in compliance before an investigation occurs. So, there are three different compliance checklists that an investigator could use during an inspection. The first is the Energy Act checklist, which is a focused 10-point checklist. Since it's focused, it only hits the high points in the rules, but you do need to make sure that your facility is in compliance with all of the rules, not just those on the Energy Act checklist. An investigator could also choose to use a different checklist, such as the Modified Compliance Evaluation Investigation, or CEI, checklist, which is much more in-depth and is about a 40-point checklist. There is also a checklist specific to temporarily out-of-service tanks. You need to be ready for any checklist that applies to you. We have checklists available on our PST Compliance Resources webpage under the How Do I Prepare for an Investigation tab. We'll talk about how to access those online resources later. So investigations can either be announced or unannounced. If it's announced, you'll normally get between one to two weeks notice. The investigation will consist of a records review and an on-site inspection. The investigator may request records when they schedule the investigation, or they may ask that you have them available on-site. If TCEQ receives a complaint regarding your facility, complaint investigations are required to be conducted unannounced. TCEQ is required to investigate within 30 days of receiving the complaint. So the fact that an investigator could show up at your facility unannounced is a good reason why you always want to maintain your records and be in compliance. 
If violations are noted during the investigation of your facility, the investigator will give you an exit interview form outlining those violations. Violations are classified into categories A, B, and C. Category A is for violations that are most severe in terms of their threat to human health or the environment. Category C violations are usually cited for partial noncompliance. Depending on the severity of the violations that are noted, you may receive a notice of violation or a notice of enforcement. If you re receive a notice of enforcement, then you will be referred to the enforcement division and will be assessed a penalty. You could also receive a field citation. These are only issued for certain category A violations. There are a few benefits of field citations over formal enforcement. Field citations are processed more quickly and there is a reduced penalty. If any violations are noted during an investigation of your facility, you are required to get into compliance. You will want to submit compliance documentation as soon as possible because this could reduce your penalty. So regarding penalties, we are often asked how much a penalty will be, but unfortunately, we don't know. Penalties are calculated by the enforcement coordinator that's assigned to your case and several different factors go into their penalty calculation. They will consider the amount of throughput or how much product is dispensed on average. They'll consider your compliance history. They will also consider any avoided costs. Avoided costs are money that you saved by not complying with the rules. For example, if you failed to have the required testing done, the money that you saved by not paying for the test would be considered an avoided cost. The enforcement coordinator will also consider whether you came into compliance quickly, which could result in good faith reduction, which is why you want to fix any issues and submit your compliance documentation as soon as possible. There's also a deferral for agreeing to an order, and that gets factored into the penalty calculation as well. Now I'm going to talk about our section and resources that are available to you. SBLGA offers confidential compliance assistance without the threat of enforcement. We develop guidance documents like the UST Compliance Notebook and the PST Super Guide. We have lots of helpful information on our webpage, www.texasenviralhelp.org. We also have an environmental program. Environmenters are qualified professionals who volunteer their time to help our customers with technical issues such as resolving violations, understanding the rules, and assisting with record keeping. You can contact a compliance assistance specialist in your area who can help you determine if you qualify for this program and try and find you a match. Or you can always call our hotline number 800-447-2827. Compliance assistance specialists across the state monitor this hotline every day that the agency is open. We also have The Advocate. This is a free email newsletter that provides information on rule changes and upcoming events or webinars like this one. You can subscribe on our website or contact us and we can sign you up. As I mentioned, one of our resources that is specific to petroleum storage tanks is the PST Super Guide, or RG-475, which is available online. You can find a link, a link to it and its web address on the instructions page of your notebook. When you go online, you can access a specific module of the Super Guide based on what information you need. The PST Super Guide is a plain language technical guide to the PST rules. So I highly recommend you read this guidance document because it includes a lot of useful information that may not be covered in this webinar. We also have a compliance resources webpage that is geared specifically to PSTs. If you go to the main TCEQ website, www.tceq.texas.gov and type in PST compliance resources in the search box that's located in the upper right hand corner, it should pull up the web page. The compliance resources web page has tools, guidance documents, the compliance checklist I mentioned earlier, and the UST compliance notebook that we are going through today. This page also has the PST updated rule summary that goes over the PST rule changes that went into effect in 2018. You can find that under the What's New in PST tab. C 
STEERS is TCEQ's online electronic permitting program, and it stands for the State of Texas Environmental Electronic Reporting System. You can use it to submit initial registrations, construction notifications, update contact ownership and operator information, and update tank details. You can also renew your self-certification and upload your financial assurance documents. We have created a guidance document called A Guide to Creating an Account in STEERS ePermitting RG531A that will take you step by step through the process on how to create a STEERS account using screenshots walking you through the program. We also have a video tutorial on YouTube called How to Set Up an Account in STEERS that will take you through this process as well. So if you're wanting to create a STEERS account, download RG531A or go to the video tutorial on YouTube. Both are very helpful tools. If you already have a STEERS account, you can add the program area called Petroleum Storage Tank Registrations. This program gives you access to the different PST related forms to update your information. In the past, there was another program called Petroleum Storage Tank Self-Certification Renewals. However, it was discontinued as of December 31st, 2021. The applications from that program have been moved to the Petroleum Storage Tank Registrations Program. So, what are the benefits to using STEERS? Mainly, it will save you time. If you submit your registration or renew your self-certification through STEERS, you remove the time it takes to mail in the forms, meaning you will receive registration and delivery certificates much faster. You can also self-certify for multiple, multiple facilities in less time too. So let's get into the notebook. We developed the UST Compliance Notebook as a record keeping tool to help you maintain compliance and have your records readily available at your site. We've recently updated it to reflect the rule updates, give it a fresher look, and meet accessibility standards. The notebook includes example records to help you know what the investigators are looking for. It also has blank log sheets with instructions that you can use. You should put this notebook in a three ring binder and keep it at your facility so that all of your records will be in one place and readily available when your facility is inspected. You'll see that the first couple of pages are instructions on how to use the notebook, request records, where to find forms, where to access online resources, and the rules that apply to PSTs. After those instructions, you will see a list of rule citations. TCEQ rules are found under Title 30 of the Texas Administrative Code. Chapter 334 contains most of the PST rules. However, Chapter 37 has the rules on financial assurance and Chapter 115 has the vapor recovery rules. In general, you need to keep your records for five years or as long as the equipment is in use. All installation records need to be kept for the lifetime of the system. The original installation documentation is valuable and can be very difficult to replace if they are lost. If you look at the notebook, you will see that it is broken down into different sections, each with their own instructions and information. The sections of the notebook include registration and self-certification, financial assurance, corrosion protection, tank release detection, piping release detection, spill and overfill prevention, and more. One of the updates we made to the notebook is we removed the tabs between each section. However, the notebook pages are numbered and we added a table of contents for easy navigation. As we go through the sections, we will discuss what the requirements are and what records you need to maintain to stay in compliance with the rules. All right, let's go through the notebook and discuss the records needed for each section. We will start with registration and self-certification. So, what are the requirements? All underground storage tanks that contain or have contained a regulated substance must be registered with the TCEQ. And all underground storage tanks that contain motor fuel are required to self-certify every year. Motor fuels include motor gasoline, diesel fuel, or any blend containing one or more of those substances. If there are any changes to the system, such as a change of ownership, tank status, or switching release detection methods, 
you will need to report those changes within 30 days. You can use the registration and self-certification form, Form 0724, to update that information. It's also very important to keep your contact information updated because the information on your registration is what the investigators use to notify you of a scheduled investigation. So if your contact information isn't up to date, you may not receive that notification. You again use the registration and self-certification form to update your contact information. You will need to keep copies of all registration and self-certification forms submitted or the copies of STEER submission confirmations within the past five years. You will need to keep a copy of your current registration certificate and a copy of your current delivery certificate as well. The delivery certificate is what is issued after you submit your annual self-certification form and it is required to be visibly posted at your facility. If you have a new system or are bringing tanks that were temporarily out of service back into service, you must submit a construction notification. Registration will send an acknowledgement letter, which will serve as a temporary delivery authorization. A temporary delivery authorization is good for 90 days from the first delivery. Becky will go over construction notifications later. One important thing to note is that tanks and compartments are required to be physically numbered on site and that numbering must match up with how you numbered your tanks and compartments on the registration form. These labels are required to be legible and permanent. So if you choose to spray paint, for instance, the numbers on your tanks and compartments, make sure you reapply as necessary so that it remains legible. Here is a photo showing a tank at a facility numbered as one. For compartmental tanks, label the compartments to match your registration as well. People usually register compartmental tanks as compartment 2A and 2B, for example. Here are pictures showing how this facility labeled their compartments. Here is the registration and self-certification form or form 0724. As I mentioned, you can submit this information through STEERS. However, TCEQ will still accept mailed or faxed forms and documents. So if you would like to use paper forms, you can find them on our website. Remember, the instruction page of this compliance notebook provides information on how to find our forms. You can type in the form number or keyword in the search box on that web page and the form will be brought up for you. We have also provided you with an example delivery certificate in your notebook. Again, make sure your delivery certificate is up to date and clearly posted at your facility. The next section in the notebook is financial assurance. This is where you can keep all of your financial assurance records. You are required to have enough financial assurance to cover corrective action, which is the cleanup of a release, and to cover third-party liability, which would be bodily injury and property damage caused by a release or an accident. The most common amounts of financial assurance that are required are $1 million per occurrence and $1 million per annual aggregate. Annual aggregate means the total amount required for all leaks that might occur within one year. Please note that these coverage amounts are most commonly required, but depending on your type of facility and your throughput, the rules may require different minimum coverage amounts. You can contact us and we can help you look through the rules to determine the amount of financial assurance that is required for your facility. The most common type of financial assurance is an insurance policy, but other forms of acceptable financial assurance include a letter of credit, a surety bond, self-insurance, or a financial test. You will need to keep current records of your certificate of insurance or your proof of other financial assurance, such as a letter of credit. You are required to submit a copy of your current financial assurance along with your annual self-certification. Otherwise, you will not receive a delivery certificate. And as you may know, you are not allowed to get fuel deliveries without a valid delivery certificate. 
As I mentioned before, you can renew your self certification using the paper form or through STEERS and upload your financial assurance documentation online. If you look in the notebook, you will see that we have provided you with an example certificate of insurance. During an investigation, the investigator will want to see the endorsement page for the tanks that are covered by your policy. Let's move on to the next section of the notebook, corrosion protection. Underground storage tank systems are required to be protected from corrosion so that they don't end up like the tanks in this photo. The corrosion protection requirements depend on the material of the system components like tanks, piping, fittings, or valves. You must protect all underground and underwater metal components from corrosion, and again, material is what determines the requirements. There are different acceptable methods of corrosion protection, such as having tanks and piping made from non-corrodible material like fiberglass reinforced plastic, or FRP, electrically isolate metal components from contact with water and soil, Coating or cladding steel tanks with composite or FRP material, this method does not extend to piping or other system components, and cathodic protection. The picture on the right shows a fiberglass tank installation. Cathodic protection. There are two types of cathodic protection, galvanic systems or impressed current systems. Galvanic systems use sacrificial anodes connected to metal components so that the anode corrodes instead of the component. Impressed current systems use a rectifier to send an electronic current to the system through attached anodes to prevent corrosion. Cathodic protection systems must be tested at installation, three to six months after installation, and then every three years after that. These tests must be conducted by a qualified corrosion specialist or corrosion technician. Impressed current systems must also be inspected every 60 days to make sure the rectifier is working properly. This can be done by the owner or operator. As I mentioned, if you have an impressed current system, you need to read the rectifier every 60 days. The rectifier is required to operate continuously. This is a picture of the example log we have provided in the notebook that you can use to maintain those records. When you're taking those readings, you'll want to ensure that the amps and volts are close to what the system was designed for, as shown on your most recent cathodic protection test. If you see any abnormalities in these readings, you will need to contact a corrosion protection specialist to evaluate your system. So let's talk about sumps for a minute. As I mentioned, corrosion protection can be achieved by isolating the component from soil and water. This example shows two different container sumps where the pump is protected from the surrounding backfill by a plastic containment structure. Again, the rules say that any metal component that comes in contact with soil or water needs to be protected from corrosion. In the photo on the left, these metal components are considered to be electrically isolated because they are not in contact with soil or water. You are required to keep these sumps clean and dry to meet the corrosion protection requirements by isolation. So as you can see in the photo on the right, those metal components are not isolated because the sump is filled with water. Similarly, the metal components would not be isolated if the sump is filled with soil. If you cannot keep the metal components from coming into contact with soil or water, your system needs to have some other form of corrosion protection, like installing a cathodic protection system to protect those non-isolated metal components. If you have FRP tanks and piping, or composite, clad, or jacketed steel tanks, then you will need to keep all installation records regarding the corrosion protection, such as an original invoice or delivery manifest. If you don't have installation records, then a written statement from a qualified corrosion specialist certifying that the tank and piping meets the corrosion protection requirements may be accepted. For components that require cathodic protection, you must keep all installation records, which could be the cathodic protection system design and information from the manufacturer or corrosion specialist who installed it. You must also keep the results of the initial test, three to six month test, and three year test, and if applicable, the results of the 60 day rectifier test. 
The thing to remember is you need to have records to prove the construction material and show that the components meet the corrosion protection requirements. If you don't have installation records, you can have a corrosion technician or corrosion specialist verify the system's construction material and obtain documentation for your records. One way a corrosion specialist can verify is to conduct a visual inspection. Here are photos showing FRP tank ribs. If you look at the picture on the left, you can see the FRP tank ribs through the sump. The white arrows are pointing to the FRP tank ribs. That is a way to visually verify the construction material. The picture on the right is showing you the inside of an FRP tank by a camera survey, which is another way to visually verify the construction material. In that photo, the white arrows are also pointing to the FRP tank ribs. If a visual inspection is not possible, another verification method that corrosion technicians or specialists can use is a structure to soil test. Here's an example of these test results that we have provided in your notebook. The corrosion technician or corrosion specialist will provide you with documentation verifying the system's construction material. This comprehensive UST system survey is an example of the documentation you could receive for your records. You may not be able to see this example here very well, but it has also been provided to you in your notebook. The next section of the notebook is tank release detection. All underground tanks in Texas are required to be monitored for leaks every 30 days. This means you cannot go more than 30 days between passing test results. There are several different approved methods of release detection, but no matter which method you use, it must be able to detect a release of 0.2 gallons per hour. And it must be conducted in accordance with a third party certification for that method of release detection. You can look up third-party certifications at the website nwglde.org, which stands for the National Work Group on Leak Detection Evaluations. Also, all release detection records must be kept for a minimum of five years. You must also conduct a 30-day walkthrough inspection of your release detection equipment. This walkthrough inspection includes checking your alarms, looking for any unusual operating conditions, and reviewing your release detection records. Unusual operating conditions could include unexplained water in the tank or erratic behavior of dispensing equipment. We provide an example log in the notebook you may use to record your 30-day walkthrough inspection. You do not have to use the logs we provide, but if you use your own log, you must make sure you are recording all the required information. You were required to conduct your first annual test of your release detection equipment by January 1st, 2022. This test is to make sure your release detection equipment that was installed as part of the UST system is operating properly. It must be conducted in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions or a code of practice set by a nationally recognized association. So this includes equipment such as the automatic tank gauge, probes and sensors, automatic line leak detector or ALLD, vacuum pumps and pressure gauges, and electronic equipment used for groundwater or vapor monitoring. You must also conduct an annual walkthrough inspection of your handheld release detection equipment. The annual walkthrough inspection includes checking that your handheld equipment, such as tank gauge sticks or groundwater balers, is operational. Here is the log we have created that you can use to record your annual walkthrough and test results. Note that the space for the annual walkthrough inspection of handheld equipment is the last listed row. We have left a couple of blank rows for you to include any additional release detection equipment you may have that's not already listed. On to release detection methods. 
Let's start by talking about the two most common methods of release detection, automatic tank gauging or ATG with inventory control and statistical inventory reconciliation or SIR with inventory control. For ATG with inventory control, you need to have a record of at least one passing ATG test every 30 days and your records of your inventory control with reconciliation. There is an exception in the rules that applies only to emergency generator tanks and used oil tanks. They may use an ATG without inventory control. For SIR with inventory control, you need to have passing results from your SIR vendor no more than 30 days apart, and you must receive those results no more than 15 days after the 30-day monitoring period. You will also need to have records of your inventory control with reconciliation. So keep in mind, even though you're using an ATG or an SIR vendor for release detection, they are not standalone methods. That means each of these methods must be paired with inventory control to be a valid method of release detection. These may be a little hard to read, but here are some example ATG test printouts. When an investigator comes to your facility, they will be looking for a passing test that is no more than 30 days from the previous passing test. So looking at the ATG printouts that are at the top of the page, they say leak test results 0 0.20 gallons per hour test invalid. And then it says low level test error percent volume too low. Those tests would not be sufficient to show compliance. But if you look at the ATG printouts at the bottom of the page, they say leak test results 0 0.20 gallons per hour test pass. Those are acceptable records and would be sufficient to show compliance. The notebook also has an example of SIR results. In this example, the SIR vendor wrote on the side, fail slash inconclusive must fill out suspected release form and research problem. So this test record would not be sufficient to show compliance for the premium tank because it is not a passing test. This would need to be reported to TCEQ as a suspected release, which Becky will be going over in her presentation. So about that inventory control. In the notebook and on our PST Compliance Resources webpage, we provide inventory control worksheets for blended fuels and non-blended fuels. These worksheets are interactive and were developed from the EPA's guidance called Doing Inventory Control Right for Underground Storage Tanks, which we have linked in the notebook and on our PST Compliance Resources webpage as well. Previous versions of our compliance notebook include example logs that were pulled directly from the EPA guidance. We have removed those and instead linked to the inventory control worksheets we have developed. Here is what that page in the notebook looks like with the links to the worksheets and the EPA guidance. If you need assistance finding them on our webpage, please give SBLGA a call or send us an email. Also note that if you are a retail facility where fuel products are sold to the public, you are required to perform in inventory control with a 30-day reconciliation regardless of your chosen release detection method. So like I said, inventory control and reconciliation must be done every 30 days. Here is a screenshot of the bottom of our inventory control worksheets. You should see this section called 30-day calculations for the reconciliation portion, also called the leak check. The rule is if your inventory control fails the leak check two months in a row, you must report this as a suspected release to the TCEQ. As I mentioned, Becky will talk more about reporting suspected releases in her presentation. The next release detection method is interstitial monitoring. This monitors the interstitial space between double wall tanks or piping for releases. If your tanks and piping were installed on or after January 1st, 2009, interstitial monitoring must be your primary form of release detection. So if you use interstitial monitoring or are required to use this method, check your sensors at least once every 30 days and keep records of the results. 
The notebook has a blank interstitial monitoring log that you can use to keep records of your 30 day monitoring results. The sensor status should be normal at least once every 30 days. Again, you do not have to use the blank logs we created, but remember, if you have your own log or record keeping system, just make sure you're documenting the required information. Another method of release detection is monitoring groundwater wells for the presence of floating or dissolved free product or vapor wells for regulated substance vapor. Inspect the wells every 30 days and keep records of your results. Also keep a record from the well installer stating that a release from any part of the system will be detected in at least 30 days. Here is the groundwater and vapor monitoring log provided in the notebook that you can use. You will record the depth from the top of the well to the top of the groundwater or vapor reading and note if there was any free product or vapors detected. The notebook includes more detailed instructions. If you use a secondary containment barrier around your UST system as your release detection, you must monitor the excavation zone for any presence of regulated substances, liquids, or vapors every 30 days. Keep records of the results. We have provided a blank secondary containment barrier monitoring log where you can document if any free product was detected by sensors or in the observation wells. The last two methods we'll talk about are not allowed for every facility. You can only use manual tank gauging as a release detection method for tanks that are 1000 gallons or less. If you use manual tank gauging, you must test the tank weekly and get a monthly average. Keep records showing your monitoring results. In the notebook, we provide a table showing the required test durations, weekly standards, and monthly standards for the tests. Here are the example logs we provide for the weekly and monthly test results. For the weekly test, you will take two stick readings to get an average, and then you will convert that average to gallons. Subtract your final gallons from your initial gallons and record the total under the test results section. If that number is greater than the weekly standard provided in the table, you may have a suspected release. For the monthly log sheet, you will use your weekly averages to get your monthly average. If that number is greater than the monthly standard provided in the table, you may have a suspected release. Again, more detailed instructions are in the notebook. Finally, 30-day tank gauging is only allowed as a release detection method for tanks that are associated with emergency generators. So if you have an emergency generator that's using 30-day tank gauging as its release detection method, make sure you keep records showing your 30-day monitoring results. This test is similar to the manual tank gauging process, however, it is only done every 30 days. We provide a table with the test standards, and again, more detailed instructions are in the notebook. So I think by now you've probably realized that the name of the game is record keeping. Now that you have this notebook, you can put it in a three ring binder and use it to maintain your records in one place. We are always willing to answer any questions you have on maintaining compliance, so please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A panel, call our hotline number, or email us at psthelp@tceq.texas.gov. Don't forget, we also have regional compliance assistance specialists to help you and our PST Compliance Resources webpage that has helpful information, tools, and guidance documents. So with that, I will turn things back over to the moderator to see if we have any questions.